to Hopscotch, uh, SPAN uh, 312, the Survey of Latin American Literature in Translation. And today it is a delight and a pleasure to have with me Phil Swanson, a professor of Hispanic studies at Sheffield University, University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. Uh, Phil is, uh, among many other things, an expert in uh, Latin American literature of the 20th century, particularly the the new novel, uh, the boom of the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Figures such as Gabriel Garcia Marquez, about whom he wrote a whole book, How to Read Garcia Marquez, uh, and also Mario Vargas Llosa, who we're going to be discussing today, uh, particularly uh, his book translated as uh, Captain Pantoja and the Special Service. So, Phil, thanks so much uh, for agreeing to do this. Uh, it's, a, it's a delight, as I say. And, and the first question is very open. How would you suggest approaching this book? Okay, well, thanks for having me, John. Nice to talk to you again and uh, carry on our many past conversations about Latin American literature. Um, th th this book, well, various ways of approaching it, really. Um, I, I would say that um, I see it principally as a kind of reworking of the um, traditional tension of civilization and barbarism, which is seen as a running sort of theme defining Latin American literature culture since more or less independence. Now, I don't know how much your sort of viewers know about that, but I could give you a little brief background before we go on to that. And I mean, as as well, as you all know, um, the, the term civilization and barbarism becomes sort of prominent, even dominant, right about the mid 19th century, particularly after the Argentine Domingo Faustino Sarmiento writes this book called Facundo, whose subtitle is Civilization and Barbarism. And essentially he conceives, it's oversimplifying slightly because these things are always ambiguous, but he sort of conceives um, the, the challenge facing these relatively new Latin American nations uh, as the, a need to sort of tame the sort of potential barbarism of the messes in the interior. And, and the, the cities are kind of these cities, fragile oases of civilization. Um, so if you look at it, if you think of a map of Latin America at that time, you know, these little dots, which are the cities, the capital is larger on the coast, these tiny little places perceived as centers of civilization. And they've got this massive interior, of the Pampa, the Andes, the jungle, um, the, the, the plains, etc. cetera. Um, and there's this sense that, you know, these new nations are these very fragile civilizations which could be swamped by the sort of um, uneducated masses of the interior. So it's um, quite problematic in, in today's term, but it, it did become extremely uh, influential. And in Peru in particular, that played out as a sort of tension between the um, what they used to call the Costa and the Sierra, or the, the coast and the the mountains really, although Sierra refers to everything, which is not the city really. So you've got Lima, the capital, and then sort of the, the interior, you know, which is populated by sort of um, less white people than in the capital, I suppose you might look at it that way. Now this sounds all very 19th century and sort of, uh, you know, to our perspective, very quite racist in a way, but it does continue right throughout the 20th century, up to this day really. And in some sense, in some ways, it's challenged by later, later novels. I mean, a lot of novelists, a lot of later writers, thinkers, novelists, try and invert the whole process and suggest that no, you know, the sort of interior was a, a example of you know peaceful harmony, as it were, um, whose communities and cultures were disrupted and destroyed and undermined by the sort of imposition of um, you know sort of the values of the of the. Um, so-called progressive center, you know. Because the big irony here is that we're talking about importing European values of civilization to consolidate independence and new nations, you know. So if, um... But anyway, so in, in, in the context of this novel, of course, you know, we do get that fundamental tension between Lima, the capital, and the sort of, you might call the jungle, I suppose, the area around the Iquitos. And um, essentially the central authorities, the, the so-called civilized center. It's represented mainly in this case by one of its arms institutions, you know, the military, um, which is the center of many of Vargas Llosa's earliest, not earlier novels. And the idea is that, you know, that they are sent to the interior both to protect the border, 
but also to instill a sense of order and civilization and discipline um, and, you know, sort of protect the, nation, the, the sort of national progress of the, of the nation as a whole. Um, and so the, the novel plays with that traditional civilization of barbarism idea, but it also, of course, kind of inverts it on one level because um, the parody or comedy comes to the fact that it's actually the central authorities in the form of the military which cause the problem in the interior in the first place. You know, you've got this sort of reasonably well-functioning sort of town, um, which is thrown as a disarray by all these soldiers, you know, attacking and wanting to sleep with and rape the, the local women. Um, so those who are bringing order actually bring sort of chaos in the sense, in the sense. And the military sort of, just say one more point, the, the military sort of double down on that by sending in a, another figure from the centre um, on a scheme to sort of um, introduce, as you know, this special service of prostitutes to service the soldiers, which is undertaken again with military precision and great deal of central planning and, you know, marketing and all the rest of it. But of course, what it does is unleash further chaos and, and, and lead to a disaster. Yeah. Um, so that's one side of it. Just, just very briefly, though, if I, do you mind if I just say one more thing? Go ahead. Just, go ahead. It, it, the opposite happens too, because in a sense, this could be seen as Vargas Llosa, you know, a bit like Garcia Marquez, offering this revisionary treatment of the civilization, Barbara's mythic, and saying that no, 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 the real problem is the is the is the central authorities who are imposing sort of, you know, sort of non-indigenous sort of European or North American influence values on the interior. And this is what actually causes this sort of disturbance and chaos. Um, but at the same time, of course, you have the, the other big parallel story alongside that of Pantaleon, or Captain Pantoja in the translation, is um, the story of the fanatical religious sect, the Brotherhood of the Ark, I think it's called in the English translation, um, which is definitely barbaric <laughs> and very dangerous. And Pantaleon's story is funny, but the story of the fanatical sect is not funny at all, really. And, you know, sort of Vargas Llosa seems to see this as a kind of a lingering danger of um, primitivism, which now becomes sort of the form of barbarism again. And there's this, so you get this peculiar sort of idea that on the one hand, um, you know, the centre is to blame for the problems of the interior. But there's still this idea that the interior itself is still basically barbaric and untamed and needs at some level to be tamed. And, you know, the Vargas Llosa then, then goes on a kind of new career in a sense in which he espouses sort of, you know, so-called liberal democracy and um, uh, scientific and technological and industrial progress to try and sort of uh, modernize the nation. And he becomes increasingly obsessed by sort of anything driven by ideology, which he increasingly starts to equate with fanaticism almost uh, as his models go on. So there's a, so it seems to me to be that the novel is both challenging that civilization and barbarism ethic, but also, I would say entirely unconsciously reasserting it or reinstating it at the same time. So that, that's sort of one, that, that's how I read it particularly, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, this, this is fan, it's fantastic and, and, and very helpful. So, uh, so, so as you say, it's, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the army which causes the initial problem um, and then the army tries to rectify that uh, through sending Captain Pantoja uh, to set up this so-called special service, um, mm -hmm. which is to be, which is a, an official service, but also officially denied, um, mm -hmm. which is to you know to service the needs mm -hmm. supposedly of the of the recruits of the of the army members, uh, but that. Like that, that attempt to impose order and efficiency, uh, it's a sort of technocratic uh, uh, vision, as you say, um, goes, go, goes haywire and becomes, a, so it, and becomes its own madness as, uh, as well, becomes, becomes deranged in, in some sense. Well, um, they literally, the, the men from the centre literally go mad, don't they, because of the heat and the, the, the heightened sexual excitement that he allegedly brings, and Pantoja himself goes mad. He goes crazy, you know. That's a, that's why he becomes undone. You know, sort of, you know. Yeah, we, we were talking, we were talking briefly before about how this also fits into a logic of, I, I think you use uh, of consumerism, right? Or, uh, 
um, the way in which um, the, the sort of rationalization comes through a form of commodification, right? Uh, selling sex and, and in with all this sort of supposed precision of of the time required and 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 and, and how much is is needed for for each individual and so on. Do you, do you want right. to talk a little bit more about that, uh, like the relationship between I don't know the market and 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 capital and commodification and the processes that we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly tentative about this because it, it it doesn't address the sort of issue of consumerism directly. Um, but you know, the, the fanatical planning with which Pantoja goes about his business is, you know, is very similar to sort of market research, and uh, it, it is like a business enterprise in many ways. And then, of course, you've got the additional idea of you know using sex to sell something, um, which adds to that sense of this being a kind of kind of attack on consumerism in a way. And of course, the, the I don't know what it's called in the translation, but um, the, 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 the the zone of the prostitutes becomes called, it's called Pantilandia yep. in Spanish. Pantiland or something, but, um, which is a bit like Disneyland, you know, so again, suggesting commodification and so on and so forth. Um, the problem with that, I think, is that, you know, sort of, you've got that parallel sense of um, this area being primitive and potentially dangerous and barbaric and in need of progress. Um, you know, and increasingly, villages have become focused on economic progress and leading to social progress in, in his later works, and his later you know, writing and thoughts of a non-literary nature. Um, and there does seem to, again, to be a little tension there to me between you know, sort of these two sides. On the one hand, you've got this sort of criticism of progress, and you've got, on the other hand, you've got this sort of implicit veneration of it and a bit like his own ambiguous attitude to popular culture you know because i mean this is again this novel itself you could see as it's a radical change from his earlier works which are much more sort of complex and difficult and sort of you know not, not many people would have you know not many mainstream middle brow readers would have <laughs> got on well but now we get this sort of basically commercially viable novel which is much simpler straightforward it's humorous something you said he'd never write a humorous novel before he did this um and, and he himself is entering the market you know he's becoming a professional writer he's had the success of the boom novels he's now a, a biggish name and he's writing sort of more consumable confections in a way this is a sort of you know much more accessible um you know you know if you're students have read Rayuela, for example, this is going to be much more accessible, isn't it? You know, it's a much more accessible sort of uh, funny, you know, structurally clever, but not hugely challenging novel, you know, so so it's also the author himself entering the marketplace in a sense. And his next novel, and Julian, the scriptwriter, is is basically setting himself up as, you know, this, it's a, it's a biographical story in which he becomes a great famous author and returns to his native brew triumphant and a, a, a big best-selling figure in world literature. So there's two things there, I, I think. Again, one picks up on something we were discussing earlier. His his early novels are, are notable for uh, an, an attempt at realism. There's there's some formal experimentation, um, mm -hmm. but, but a sort of investigation and diagnosis as to the, what the problems of Peru, right, e e essentially, in, in different ways. And... Um, and there's something so ludicrous. I mean, we were talking. You were suggesting this is in some ways a denial of reality. The the kind of ex comic exaggeration that we see in in Pantaleon, it, it may riff off some of those long-standing tropes of civilization and barbarism, but it, it takes them to this this comically exaggerated uh, level. I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that notion of the denial of reality in um, in Pantaleon. Yeah, I mean, sort of, so the, the three previous novels, well, we'll not just realise, they're almost, they're, they're pretty socialist, actually, in, in, in some respects, uh, even verging on the Marxist in, the, in, the, in some of the earlier novels. Um, but although, despite the structural complexity and fragmentation, unlike many of the other examples of the new narrative you're probably looking at, they, they are fundamentally realist novels. They're, they're trying to offer a, offer a much bigger, more complex picture of reality, but they are basically great realist novels you know, um, in an almost Balzacian, Balzac-like tradition. Um, 
and then we get so the the character is very rooted in reality, but now we get a main character who's called Captain Pantaleon Pantoja. You know, it's again a, a silly name. Even the name is comical. You know, um, and people call him Panty and all this sort of thing. There's uh, there's and, and the, the the thing which interests me, and I mentioned this to you before we we started doing the recording, is that um, I think this what's interesting in this bit is is the treatment of the military um, because. Um, the novel set in 1950s, when more or less when many of his earlier novels were set, the dictatorship of Odria in Peru. Um, but it's written in the 1970s, when we have a, a, another military dictatorship of a different kind, the, the Belasco regime. Odria very much on the right, Belasco very much on the left. Um, so two very different sorts of military dictatorship. But in the novel, there's no sense of this reflecting the the real military of the 50s or the military of the 70s. The, the military is this this sort of archetypal sort of comic group of sort of you know pompous idiots who 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 sort of throw the weight around and you know sort of look down scornfully on others. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting that that sort of movement away from an engagement with reality to sort of um, engaging with these sort of archetypal comic types. And this is the beginning, of course, of Vargas's shift away from the left, which people have famously talked about since then. And I, 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 you get that sense of breaking with reality, this sort of almost like the author is now sort of sitting back, maybe ever so slightly smugly, um, laughing at the problems and making it into a joke rather than sort of dealing with it. With the sort of nitty gritty of it as he did in his earlier novels and that process continues in the next novel um, and then of course he gets onto his other his more historical novels which tend to deal with this idea of phoneticism and the dangers of, of ideology and so on and so forth so there is this this is the beginning of this i mean i think it's probably at the time i don't think people could probably fully identify but it's the beginning of a shift to the right in a sense you know sort of uh, I, and I thought it was interesting. I, I thought it was interesting what you said about this is, um, you know, Vargas Llosa, you know, appealing in a different way or maybe to a different constituency. Um, uh, this is this this novel has been made into not just one but two movies, and it's very cinematic in in, in lots of ways. You know, I, I feel the the style in which it's written, the way it's sort of there's lots of it's as though he's trying to emulate. Um, sort of forms of montage, cinematic montage, as he shifts from one scene to another, uh, or pan shots that try to sort of uh, take in a, a landscape uh, uh, quite quickly. Um, uh, the, uh, and technology and, and communication media are also an issue at, uh, at the novel. There's the radio uh, host who... Um, yeah. uh, I, I wonder if you, you'd you like to say anything about, the, 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 about form and, and technology in this novel? Just two things, quickly to mention the radio host, Cynthia, is kind of interesting because, you know, I drew this dif distinction between the center and the jungle, the space of civilization, the space of barbarism, because the novel's largely set in Iquitos, which is this in-between space. It's, it's a provincial town. Um, it has some of the accoutrements of civilization, but is, you know, is presented as sort of petty and, and you know, rather, you know backward, backwater in some ways. And Cynthia, the radio presenter, I think, embodies that you know he's with the voice of progress on the one hand he, he's but he has this sort of parochial concern and local pride but he's also a gossip and exploits the scandal and so on and so forth so i think the ikitas thing is interesting it's this in between space and that, that what gives the novel some of its sort of uh, drama in a sense is that sort of sense that that sort of place could go one way or the other um but in terms of sort of um not so much technology but form um I think it's kind of interesting that you mentioned this idea of you know sort of uh, montage and so on because you know a lot of Vargas Llosa's novels, early novels, were as I say very complicated, and you would and there was a kind of a very explicit use of montage in the sense of you would might have you know twelve different perspectives on the same page, you know sort of 
different dialogues, different people talking about the same event or in different places and times. You'd be constantly cutting back from one to the other, as you might do in a, in a sort of film. Um, and you know, his idea was to his desire was to create this so-called autonomous narrative, in which the figure of the author disappears and the narrative appears to propel itself, and it's up to the reader to work it out. Now, in a sense, this novel is a kind of refined version of that. I mean, it is. I mean, the narrator to some extent does disappear. You've got dialogue. You've got sort of maybe some stream of consciousness dream sequences. You've got uh, documents, letters, transcripts of broadcasts. But there's no sort of traditional omniscient narrator as such. And there is a bit, but not as such. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a kind of development of that sort of new novel formal technique, but in a very orderly manner. Um, and in a very accessible manner. And I, I can't help feeling myself that it actually draws attention to the presence of the author rather than recreate the disappearance of the author, you know, because there is a sense of mastery behind all this. And that comes out very strongly in the following novel when the author, the, like, and Julian, the scriptwriter, when the author figure actually turns up at the end and is revealed as the creator behind the whole thing, you know. So uh, I get the sense that, you know, the reader is not quite being shaken up as he or she might have been by some of the earlier novels which are really challenging sort of novelistic conventions uh, in a sense the reader's sort of saying well this is a clever guy writing a clever novel you know i like this i'll buy some more of this stuff and i think this all ties in back with that sort of sense of duality you know of sort of on the one hand you've got you know previously radical and still very much socially concerned and socially engaged author but clearly beginning a kind of shift in a, a new Possibly slightly rightwards direction, you know. Um, but I don't want to be too critical about this. I know you get to you get to play that press because of this shift to the right. But uh, at the same time, I quite admire him. I think he's he's very honest and very brave, actually. You know, in sort of taking his later career, and he goes public in a way that a lot of other writers don't. You know, so I'm not being hugely critical. I just think this is an interesting moment. Um, I think sort of looking back, we can see the beginnings of that shift to what would come later. Yeah, I think with this and also with perhaps even more with a, a later novel, The Storyteller, El Hablador, in, in, which is also set in or, or concerned with the uh, Amazon, mm -hmm. Vargas Llosa allows for multiple readings. Like it, 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 he, he, he lets, he, there is this sense of mastery, as you say, there's a sense of, there's also this sense of I can do anything, you know, like, uh, okay, now I'll do a comedy. I'll, sh I'll show you how to do a comedy. I'll show you how to do a, a, hist a long historical epic. I'll show you how to do this. And um, uh, uh, which, but but he also, the, the books are interesting because they uh, allow for still for, for many re readings. I mean, they're not, they're not necessarily doctrinaire, even if they follow his particular obsessions. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that, that, I, I think this is probably me or us as critics sort of picking out this, the unconscious of the text in the sense here, what we're saying, and there is, there, we see what's going on behind it. Um, but no, absolutely not doctrinaire at all. And I mean, you just look at, I mean, you and I had a slight disagreement thing about the nature of Pantaleon himself, you know, sort of, um, I was a bit more sympathetic towards him than, than you, I think, in a sense, you know, but he is a fundamentally sort of ambiguous character, you know, is it? I mean, he's a fool, he's a buffoon, but he's also somebody we feel sympathy for. I mean, he's, you know, sort of... And the whole thing about um, sexuality and gender as well is um, very mixed. You know, there's a sort of terribly old-fashioned sort of objectification of women going on. But there is a sort of... It's very problematic, but there is a sort of sense in which, you know, that the, the, the main female prostitute sort of... is the one who really upsets the apple cart, actually, and sort of undoes... Captain Pantoja himself. I'm not sure what she's called in the translated version, the Brazilian, or she's called La Brasileña yeah. in the Spanish. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there is a, and you know, what, what do you make of Panda in the end? You know, is he a sort of an image of you know the the, the, the sort of failed emptiness of sort of you know military or central planning, or is he a kind of modern anti-hero who's plagued by anxieties and you know sort of feels alienated, doesn't know? It? seeking a place in life and um you know sort of tries on one occasion to sort of escape his inhibitions you know free his inner self and boy does he pay for it you know he gets end up being sucked back into the system but in, a, in an even worse way before when he's packed off to sort of this remote 
garrison and the, the freezing cold interior. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a critique of machismo, but it's also on, on you know it also takes machismo to some extent for for granted. It's um, you know. Yeah, and I think that I think that's true in nearly all of Vargas Llosa's novels. Actually, you know, sort of. Um, um, and I think, I think it's quite interesting with Vargas Llosa because you, you know he is a sort of obviously contemporary, living and breathing sort of novelist who talks and writes about all sorts of things and has a very public life and has had you know interesting relationships with women in, in a, you know often in a very public setting. Um, and I think he does have both sides to him. You know, he isn't again. You, you know. As early on as this massive attack on the sort of brutality of military education, the, the mm -hmm. time of the hero in that first novel. But, you know, Vargas is himself a bit of a macho man, you know, sort of a, he grew up in that system, you know, he like, you know, he's a tough guy. Uh, he loves football and I think he likes boxing, I'm not quite sure, but, you know, sort of, so he is very much a sort of macho man, but also a sort of, you know, a sort of very thoughtful, um, man, and I thought, it's interesting. I think you might think about this from the genesis. I found his later novels that there is an increasing sense of sort of women not so much coming to the fore, but having a more prominent role, and perhaps having a bit more sort of power or say in things. Um, particularly in the novel, it's called Four Corners in English, Quatro Esquinas, uh, where you get a sort of female journalist who becomes this representative of civil society taking on the corruption of the Fukimori regime. So, yeah, and that goes back to your point, you know. It isn't, it's still not just straightforward. Um, and his brand of realism was never straightforward. In a sense, his whole plan was to sort of expand realism by showing it in all its contradictions and multiple perspectives and getting this almost kaleidoscopic version of reality, you know, which, um, and I think to some extent that still happens here, you know. Um, you know, the military position, Pantoka's Pant position, Sinchi's position, the the Brotherhood of the Arc's position, you know, the wife's position. So we still do get those multiple perspectives and so on and so forth, which is, um, yeah, so it is, a, it is a sort of, you know, in some ways it's a novel which is narrowing its perspe the perspective of Madagascar, but it's also still opening it up to readers. And I think it's probably a great novel for new, you know, non-native Spanish-speaking readers. It's probably a great entry, in fact, into sort of... Um, Vargas writing and sort of Latin American writing more generally. Well, that's a, a perfect way to end with that thought about the continually, continually kaleidoscopic nature of Vargas Llosa's uh, uh, writing, um, which is not straightforward, uh, not simple, even though this is perhaps a particularly accessible text in, in various ways. Phil, Thank you so much uh, for your time and, and expertise. It's been a pleasure uh, to chat and to learn a little bit more about Vargas Llosa and his novel. Likewise, good talk to you, John. <laughs>